Good afternoon. Um, a little over 50 years ago, Edgar DeWitt Jones wrote a book about the first 70 years of the Beecher Lectures. Something of his assessment of the lectures was given and was indicated in the title of the book called The Royalty of the Pulpit. Uh, <clears throat> and some of the categories he used to describe, uh, to, to categorize the preachers were Olympians, Titans, messengers, and shepherds. So he had uh, a high view of preaching. As you probably know, Henry Ward Beecher gave the first three sets of lectures for the first three years. And he set a precedent which fortunately we have not followed. For Henry Ward Beecher gave 33 lectures <laughs> in his course of the Beecher lectureship. Granted over three years, but you can still do the division and there were a lot of lectures uh, every year. As I was looking again at the book, it struck me that uh, a number of Baptists have been prominent in the lectureship. Uh, the first Baptist, as I can figure out at least, was Ezekiel Robinson in 1882, who was the president of Brown University. And the second was, was uh, John Albert Brodus, uh, whose book, The Preparation and Delivery of Sermons, some of us can still probably remember as being used as a textbook in homiletics. And we returned again to Brown for the third Beecher lecture with William Fawn, who was the president of Brown, giving the lectures in 1908. And then in the more contemporary period, of course, one comes across the names such as Harry Emerson Fosdick and Edward McNeil Poteet of the Euclid Avenue Baptist Church in Cleveland, and then Harold Cook Phillips of the First Baptist Church in Cleveland, and then the only father-son team that we've had, uh, Gene Bartlett, uh, who was president of Colgate Rochester Seminary in 1961, and his son, David Bartlett, who was the associate dean here, who gave them in 2001. And just a couple of other names, James Forbes, and Peter Gomes, and Gardner Taylor. So <clears throat> our preacher today joins a distinguished heritage of Baptist preachers who have had the word of the Lord to deliver to this congregation. He's the third Baptist minister from Cleveland. I think that's probably a record. I haven't checked that out, uh, Otis, whether <laughs> that's a record or not. But at least it is now my great pleasure indeed to welcome to this second feature lecture, Otis Moss, who is the pastor of the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church in Cleveland, and his second lecture is Social Justice, the Tie that Binds. Otis. Thank you very kindly for these kind words of introduction. As you talk about the lineup of Baptist and the distinguished list you call, we could of course add to that the late Kelly Miller Smith and the legend still with us, Henry Mitchell, and the late Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. The Beecher Lectures have no doubt kept alive, not only in North America, but I think throughout the world, uh, a special kind of appreciation for the necessity of the proclamation of the word. Although that reality has been devalued from time to time and <clears throat> has been listed both in lectures and writings as going through periods of decline. I understand that uh, here at Yale, uh, the legendary 
personality, Dr. Luckup, was in conversation with one of his colleagues who was trying to convince him that homiletics was really an unnecessary subject in seminary curricula. And he was, Dr. Luckett asked him, why do you say that? He said, well, because anybody can preach. Dr. Luckett said, oh, no, that's not true. I've heard you try many times. <laughs> <laughs> you have kept alive what we could say is an ancient necessity whether we live up to those necessities or that necessity or expectation or not, it does not devalue its importance in the life of the aliveness of the gospel, the life of the mind, the dynamic of the church. Thank you again. Uh, for sharing and for inviting me to share in this tradition. It is, it is more than a joy uh, to witness again members of my personal family and my extended family. An individual uh, from whom I have learned much across the years, an alumnus of the Yale Divinity School, Otis Moss III. It is always a privilege uh, to have him present. Uh, there was a time when he sought me for counsel and advice, and uh, that has changed in recent times, and now I check with him to get updates on the post-modern, post-Christian, post-soul theological perspectives. I want to thank the members of the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church, again, my wife of 38 years, uh, associate Ministers, Margaret Mitchell and Sam Titmore, and uh, uh, Brother Gary. This couple, this team, provide the leadership for our health education program at Olivet. And uh, Associate Minister Sam Titmore is in charge of a cable television station in Cleveland, Channel 20, and uh, when you're in charge of something, you can take the team, I suppose, wherever you want to take them, and you set the priorities, and they decided to come to Yale this week, and we thank you uh, for your presence, and for those with whom we have had the privilege of knowing and sharing ministry across the years, it is so good to see your faces again. It should be said that the concert last night uh, was historic, and it has a place, I think, in every worship experience, in my opinion, in the world. I think we ought to give Dwight Andrews and his artists another hand in his absence. <laughs> May we bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Dear God, we thank you and praise your name forever and ever. Thank you for salvation greater than our sin. 
thank you for grace greater than our grief. Thank you for joy greater than our sorrow. Thank you for wisdom greater than our knowledge. Thank you for power greater than our strength. Thank you for healing greater than our affliction. Thank you for your presence greater than our fragile relationships. Thank you for light greater than our learning. Thank you for a blessed assurance greater than our doubts and fears. Thank you for an eternity greater than our limited life and fleeting journey upon the earth. Thank you for patience greater than our pain. Thank you for revelation greater than our anticipation. Thank you for vision greater than our sight. Thank you for harvests greater than our needs. Thank you for your forgiveness greater than our worthiness. Thank you for redeeming love and life everlasting in Christ. Christ, our liberator and perfect gift of grace. O oh God, we thank you. Amen. Amen. I want to continue the line of thought opened on yesterday preaching as a prophetic ministry. When one's life is open to God, when one's ministry is under the unlimited influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we become a part of a bold adventure. We are literally instruments to the glory of God. Preaching, I think, is a never-ending engagement and ministry is an unbroken tie that binds us to the timeless and the timeless. As a college student, I had the opportunity of listening to an individual who exemplified, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, more than I can adequately describe as this bold adventure. When I heard him speak on our campus for three days and had the opportunity, the students did, of engaging in dialogue with him, I wanted to see his ministry close up. So a group of us pooled our nickels and dimes and planned a trip to America's Georgia and spent some time with Clarence Jordan at the Cornelia Farm. It was literally the first time I had come face to face, shall we say, on the ground of a bold experiment 
in living out the true meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ as well as proclaiming it with a fearless determination. The kind of preaching that Dr. Benjamin E. Mays said we all talk about but seldom experience. Clarence Judden, and you will remember him as the author of the cotton patch versions of the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles and the Letters of Paul and the General Epistles. Clarence Judden, back in 1942, was the founder, with some others, of the Cornelia Farm determined to experiment with the principles of the teachings of Jesus as found in the Acts of the Apostles. And in organizing this community in an unbelievable place at an unbelievable time, he became a living witness of what it truly means to be a proclaimer of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seems to me that, that the leaders of the Cononier Farm were putting into practice what Isaiah 61 talks about and what Jesus read about and commented on in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I referenced on yesterday that Walter Brueggemann says that the, the 61st chapter of Isaiah came into the community of faith after the exile at a time when there was a struggle to reshape the life of the community after a long period of brokenness. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. On that farm in America's Georgia, in, in the heart of hostility, a group of reporters went down to visit Clarence Jordan and asked him, uh, Mr. Jordan, they tell us that you are running a communist farm down here. <laughs> Have any communist been down here to visit you? He said, I don't know if we've had any or not. We <laughs> didn't give that kind of examination but I do know the Klan has been here <laughs> because they have been pretty obvious <laughs> in their visitation. The interesting thing is the reporter wanted to know have any communists been here? Uh, they were not quite ready to deal with the presence of Jesus on a farm. Uh, in the middle of uh, the power of American apartheid. They wanted to know, have you had any communists to come here? 
The same question was raised with Mordecai Johnson at Howard University uh, when uh, they had a student election and one student was running as a Democrat and one as a Republican, one as a Socialist and one as a Communist. So the Un-American Act Un-American Activities Committee became alarmed about what was happening at the, uh, on the campus of Howard University and wanted Dr. Johnson to stop the election. And Dr. Johnson said, well, that would be totally undemocratic. <laughs> and, of course, uh, people were on edge. And when the election was over, <laughs> the communist candidate got 1% of the vote an affirmation of the thing, of the fact that we've heard so many times the things we fear most are often the things that never happen. You heard us talk about on yesterday the bold adventure of Mordecai Johnson, of Howard Thurman, Mary McLeod Bethune, Dorothy Height, and uh, reference that of Harry Emerson Fosdick, Hugh Latimer and Ridley, and their colleague, today, Clarence Jordan. And let's look for a moment now at going beyond the personal and engaging the social. And we get a marvelous window, really an open door to this. When we visit Nazareth, on uh, a regular Sabbath, well, if any Sabbath can be considered regular, I think every Sabbath is extraordinary. As Jesus visits the, Sab the, 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 the synagogue on this Sabbath day, he is given the scroll, and he opens it and reads from the section of Isaiah 61. When he reads it, he is safe. He sits down, he is still safe. And then he preached a sermon shorter than the text. I don't know how many ministers here <laughs> have a record of preaching a sermon shorter than your text. When he gave the sermon, he simply said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. And that's where the trouble started. Isn't it amazing that he could get in so much, get into so much trouble with such a short sermon? Most of us get into trouble with long sermons one way or the other. I think Somebody here might have had that experience. I have. Uh, a minister speaking one Sunday, he spoke about 65 or 70 minutes. And uh, afterwards, people lined up to say the usual, whether they mean it or not. Uh, but there was a little, a young kid in, in line, and as the kid came down the child and shook the minister's hand. The child said, you spoke too long. <laughs> and people kept on saying, Reverend, we are glad to have you, thus and so, and the child got in line again. <laughs> and came around again and said, you didn't speak loud enough. And they kept going, and the child got in line again and came around the third time. And by now, the parents are getting embarrassed. And uh, the child said, you know, your thoughts were not very clear. 
and trying to cover up, uh, the mother said, don't, don't, don't mind what uh, our young Johnny is saying. He's just repeating what everybody's saying. <laughs> It can be very sobering when we consult with our children about the status of our sermons or our faith or our institutions or the position of the church in the contemporary world. The personal, the personal must engage the social if there is to be fulfillment. Now, some people, I, I think, maybe, uh, maybe are committed to a kind of vertical gospel and uh, th that says, you know, get right with God. And some people are committed with a gospel that protects you before you are born, born and, and, and looks out for you after you die. Uh, but they, they, don't give a, they don't care anything about what happens in between. They will go to war. They will bomb houses and shoot doctors about life before birth. And they will burn down churches and burn people at the stakes about life after death. But that little dash in between, they have no lasting, authentic commitment with reference to social justice. We maintain that the gospel of Jesus Christ moves us to engage the social. And it is at this point that the late Dr. Sandy F. Ray said that the ministry is a dangerous assignment. A dangerous assignment. And that's... that's that's a great text or subject for any ordination service. A dangerous assignment. I send you out as lambs among wolves. Now, can you imagine the commander-in-chief or the chair of the Joint Chiefs, or the General, or the Secretary of Defense saying to the troops, now, ladies and gentlemen, we send you to the Middle East as lambs among wolves, and we want you to be as wise as serpents and harmless as a dove. Now that's the contrast, the abiding contrast between discipleship of Jesus Christ and discipleship of the state and the flag. Maybe I'll come back to that in a moment. Hey, you know, because of the impending dangers of being lambs, or going out, I should say, as lambs among wolves. Most of us, most of us, uh, soon develop not the theology of the living Christ, but the, the, the ideology of the wolves. In order to be conversant and comfortable and protected by them. And the church has made that compromise. Someone says that it made that compromise 
uh, somewhere around 325 A.D., when, when, when the church surrendered the method of Christ and picked up the weapons of Caesar and has gone through the world tiptoeing and sometimes marching and sometimes scraping and bowing, trying to dress like Caesar and talk like Caesar and walk like Caesar and preach like Caesar. You can say amen. If you amen. The burning question is, how do you minister among wolves without adopting a wolf ideology as a permanent substitute for the message of Jesus Christ. Nietzsche, who could not be categorized, I'm sure, as an evangelical, <laughs> but, but, but Nietzsche had some information that, that, that some theists did not have. He said, when you fight a monster, be careful lest you become a monster. Henry David Thoreau put it another way. He said, be careful that you do not become like the evil you seek to remove. Paul said, let us not be overcome by evil, but let's overcome evil with good. And Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And it, isn't it remarkable that Jesus didn't say, I will? Maybe, if, provided that, or uh, depending upon the outcome of the next election, we might have the possibility of, given various contingencies, if we don't get stuck in some existential mud. Uh, but he said, I have overcome the world. And... Uh, if we are to be proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, we must engage the conditions of all humanity, which means that praise alone is not enough. Now, don't, don't get me wrong here. I believe in praise. I believe that you ought to shout sometime. And uh, if somebody doesn't hurry up and shout, I'm not talking about right now. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, you ought to have enough stuff in you to shout yourself. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was, was a boy growing up in the country, uh, a minister told me the story of uh, uh, a young seminarian who went to, was assigned to a church, and the, the young minister preached, and there was a person in what we called in those days the Amen Corner. And uh, the young minister started using some terminology that had just been picked up from first class in theology, talking about soteriology and eschatology, all of that. And this, this saint in the amen corner shouted all the way through the message. He was a little confused. Went to her at the end of the worship and said, you know, uh, I really didn't think I did very well today. She said, that's right. He said, but you know, I, I, I didn't quite connect like I wanted to, and my conclusion was not as dynamic as I had hoped that it was. She said, that's sure enough, right? 
He said, but you shouted all the way through the sermon. She said, oh yes, shouting is my job. And I'm determined to do my job, whether you do yours or not. <laughs> I, I vote for praise. But praise should not be divorced from protest. They should not be seen as antithetical. Praise and protest are not enemies. And to be able to praise and protest under the conditions of hostility is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Please permit me a personal footnote here. Uh, on, on the Selma march, from Selma to Montgomery, if you tune in uh, on the recordings and the videos, you will, you, will, you will hear praise on that march. You will hear people in a certain rhythm saying, I'm going to do, I'm tempted to sing it now, uh, but I want, I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do, and what the Spirit says do, I'm going to do, oh Lord, I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. I'm going to vote when the Spirit says vote. When the Spirit says vote, I'm going to vote, oh Lord, I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. But at the end of that march, I was on the same plane with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and when we stopped in Atlanta, it was a charter plane. When we stopped in Atlanta, and a, a news reporter got off and rushed back on the plane to announce that an individual had just been killed on her way from Montgomery back to Selma. Her name, Viola Craig Liuzzo. Praise, but protest. There is no, there is, is no antithesis between praise and protest. It's not one or the other, but both and. So if, if you really know how to praise, you learn the, the authentic praise out of pain and struggle and tears, and tragedy, and hurts, and wounds. And that's the kind of proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ we see in Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. It's a different kind of praise. Let me say this. Try, try in a world like this where the flag is greater than the cross and we like to wave the flag and wear the cross but not bear the cross. Uh, you have heard that it was said, God bless America. But I say unto you, pray for all of the Osama bin Ladens and the Saddam Husseins. Bless them that curse you and pray for them that despitefully use you. I say unto you, be kind, be as kind to Castro as you are to the Saudi family and the leaders of China and Russia. This, however, is difficult 
in, uh, in a society, for an individual or for society, when we are afflicted or infected with hubris, it's almost an incurable disease. Incurable not because of despair, but because of arrogance. When Robert Kennedy wrote that volume, small but profound in my thinking, he was dealing with the war in Vietnam, and he quoted uh, from one of the Greek writers, a good man yields when he knows his course is wrong and corrects the error. The only sin is pride. <clears throat> now, Tillich said, uh, sin is estrangement. Niebuhr said, it's pride. Uh, some have defined it as missing the mark. So take these theological perspectives and ask uh, from your prayer meeting, from your pulpit, are we missing the mark in our domestic and foreign policy? And what does that say about preaching? What does it say about the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when you do this uh, in a situation of arrogance where there is arrogance of the spirit, arrogance of power, arrogance of dogma, in such a state, difference is defined as heresy. Criticism becomes treason. Evaluation becomes unpatriotic. The poor become inconvenient liabilities. The uninsured sick become disposable inventory, and the weak become property for profit. And Jesus says we are to proclaim the good news in a world like this. That means combining praise and protest and going out as lambs among wolves to administer without becoming a wolf. Amos experienced this one day. I have found where he had been before the ordination council. Uh, I don't know what kind of credentials he had in a formal sense, but he got up one morning and decided to preach. And guess what he said? I don't like the way you are praising. I despise your feast. Now, I don't know what I would do if someone would break in on our Holy Communion service one Sunday and start talking like this. I think I do know what, would, what we would do. We have some security folk around the church, and they, they have been given prior instructions. But Amos says, uh, I will not accept any of this. Let justice roll down like a river and righteousness as a mighty stream. This kind of audacious and courageous proclamation by Amos the prophet, uh, and then he rounded it out. At the beginning and the end, thus saith the Lord. And guess what? The first person to raise an objection was the president of the local ministerial association. His name was Amaziah. And Amaziah, the priest. That's what the book says. Amaziah, the priest, went in to the king. And said, uh, Mr. President, I mean King Jeroboam, the nation is not able to bear the words of this radical prophet Amos. And two things must happen. 
we must find a way to make him be quiet or we will have to run him out of town. And maybe, maybe, maybe Amos was moving in the spirit of what Petrarch was talking about in his letters of old age when he said, uh, and this is not an exact quote, he said, uh, when a word must be spoken to further a good cause and those whom it behooved to speak remain silent, anybody ought to speak and break the silence which is sometimes fraught with evil because one word spoken at the right time can further the welfare of a nation when those whom it behooved to speak remained silent. God commissions prophets not always officially ordained and their messages coming down through the streams of history. Tell Moses to be quiet. You remember what they said when Moses came out of his uh, first conference with Pharaoh. They said, you're going to make it hard on us. Why are you doing this? Amos, be quiet. Wycliffe, be quiet. Ridley, Latimer, Roger Williams, Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, Michael Moore, Bill Moyers, James Forbes, Marion Wright Edelman, William Coffin. Tell them to be quiet and get out of Washington. Soren Kierkegaard talked about quote, Christendom dishonesty, end of quote. And then he said, to speak well of God only, but do not enter into relation with God. That's praise without engagement. Can we share the tears of the mothers of Iraq, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, and the orphans. God has anointed us. God has consecrated us to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to give new eyes to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim a new year, the year of God's favor, a year that is strange and difficult to place or publish on traditional calendars, a year when people get new names, a year when a declaration of interdependence is written, a year when a declaration of human rights is not only published but proclaimed and practiced. A year when a letter from a Birmingham jail becomes the sermon of the year when preacher, priest, prophet, and pastor, and sermon all become one. Or is it the year when a German pastor says, God is my leader and spends eight years in jail for having done so? Or is it the year when a Mandela goes from prison to president and former jailers find themselves saying, Mr. President? Or will it be the year when we properly administer to perhaps 50 million African children who have become orphans because of the pandemic of HIV and AIDS? Or will it be the year when we discover how to care for, prevent, and cure this dreadful disease? Or will it be the year when Bishop Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission becomes a force in Baghdad and in Washington, on the West Bank and in the Knesset? 
prophetic preaching and prophetic action and prophetic being must cohere with preparation, revelation, rights, responsibilities, risks, rewards, suffering, service, and sacrifice. This is our calling. This is our responsibility. There ought to be, there ought to be the kind of the kind of prophetic preaching that inspires and impacts everything else in the life of the community. When, when song and sermon and art and literature and, and, and labor market and, and, and medicine and economics are all impacted by the proclamation of the word and we have a special kind of experience with that in the African American community but not only in the African American community for instance in the, in the African American community we can take a text fret not thyself because of evil doers neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity and then there's a song that goes with that sermon that says Satan your kingdom must come down I'm going to preach until I tear your kingdom down. I, I, I'm going to pray until I tear your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this land. Satan, your kingdom must come down. My text when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. The song that goes with the text says, I know my God's a rock in a weary land. I know my God's a rock in a weary land and a shelter in the time of a storm. He was a rock. God was a rock way back in creation. A rock when Adam fell. A rock up in the heaven and a rock way down in hell. I'm about to get happy now. I know my God's a rock in a weary land and a shelter in the time of a storm. When sermon and song, when practice and preaching, when prophecy and conditions are all met together and we engage them under the Spirit of God which says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news. Good news. Good news in a dangerous situation. Good news in a hostile situation, good news in a bad situation, good news in a war-torn situation, good news in a violence-bred situation, good news. Now that's not all I have to say, but I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>